Yo, 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 what's going on, world? It's your boy Najee from rapradar.com. Today I got a very special guest, man. Seated to my right. Listen, man, these records that he got, that he's writing, producing, they all over your radio. I got my man, Hitmaker. Nice, what up, bro? What's up, my brother? How are you, man? How you feeling, man? Appreciate Yo, it. I'm just excited to have this episode, man. I've been tapped in with you since, you know what I mean, for a little bit, man. Yeah, yeah. How you feeling? I seen you put a post up and said, like, 80 million sold or some shit like yeah, that. Yeah, um, today, shit, Lil Dirk album just went gold, so that's 80 and a half. So I'm on chasing that 100 million, man, oh, right hold now, up. for real. Hold on, hold on. When you say 80 million, you mean, like, just... In totality of like everything that you've written, produced, like what does eighty million mean? Like? Yeah, like so eighty million records that I've either written, produced, and been involved with. What does that mean to you? That's to be able to touch numbers know. like I, that. Like yeah. does that mean some shit? Like, to me, like it's cool when I'm typing it or whatever, but like to yeah. even say it, it just be like. I, I ain't trying to, you know what I'm saying, be on myself too much or whatever. But like, man, I just know that how hard I work, and I'm just blessed to even be in this position. So. Shit paying off. Ain't nobody gonna scream my praises as loud as me, so yeah. I might as well go ahead and get that off. Fuck nah, it. that's a fact. I love that, nigga. When you do the hundred million and the party, I'm gonna be there. Oh no, nah, nah, it's we gonna gotta... be big. It's gonna be big for yeah. sure. Nah, I'm loving it. Um, I saw recently they just made the announcement. Uh, was it VP A and R at Empire? Or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a big deal. Shout out big to Gazi. Shout, Shout out to Gazi. Yeah, yeah. Tina Davis. Everybody over there. Well, crazy shit is, is that. A lot of people didn't know that I was vice president of a r at Atlantic, and I was there for four years yeah. prior to that to me taking this new position. So, man, I was at Atlantic. You know, um, we ended up uh, not, um, parting ways, or whatever, amicably. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And shit, I got with Gazi. Now the press release came out with me putting out this new single, whatever. Yeah. I've been with Gazi since about April. And my first thing that I did with Gazi is that young blue Chris Brown and Two Chains baddest oh. record. You know what I'm saying? Ooh. It's about to go number one right now. Yeah. I executive produced Tink album. That shit was top ten on Billboard. It's yeah. um her biggest project, been number one on Apple Music for like a month or some change. So it's a good vibe. Man, I'm loving that. We we definitely gonna get into these records. Okay, um, for sure. I wanna know, so with the Atlantic situation, because that's that's the thing. I remember when that happened, you yeah. signed to Atlantic, big yeah, deal, yeah. you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. I'm like, you know, we all watching it from afar. Tell me like what I guess you say you parted amicably. Like, what what do you feel like was the difference? I guess just between that situation and kind of like why you had to part. Um, the difference on a creative side of things, is, but it's from a selfish stand base because like I'm a creative, so when I make a song or whatever, if it takes. 12 months for a song to come out like i'm over the song right. already you know right. what i'm saying i've made 1200 more songs or whatever right so from that stand base yes but i mean shit, i'm not gonna lie i had a lot of success with atlantic records we we were a part of a bunch of big records a boogie look back at it um meek mill dangerous and a slew of other records i think i probably did like in my stint of being there i probably did over like 80 songs 100 yeah. songs with atlantic you know yeah. what i'm saying so that was a blessing, man, and the bag, you know? Nah, for sure, absolutely. That's a that's mm -hmm. a huge move. I mean, outside of just, you know, fans of the music, like, a lot of artists watch this, up-and-coming artists okay. who, you know, trying to figure out shit, and, like, when you, you know, you got a, a lot of knowledge. When you're talking about, like, you know, independent mm -hmm. versus, like, majors and trying to, like, you know, get your shit popping, yeah. what you feel like is the best situation, like, if you could give advice to, to niggas watching? It depends on what your situation is. I think that if you were, um financially you, you're not chasing no bag or whatever and like you feel like yo you can get it done and like you you cool in a space you are I would tell you to grow you know what I'm saying independently but if you're in a position where you 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 need a bag and you just really talented and the real key of that shit now it's not about like it's not independent or, or or big label to me. It's like, who really gives a fuck about you? Mm. Is that A&R going to really champion you? Yeah. Is he willing to put his career on the line? Is he really grown with you? Is that somebody that you feel like is a part of your career like that? If not, you're just taking a bag. And you know what I mean? Bags is cool to take, but sometimes it might not work out your way. So yeah. the most important part about your whole career is having people that really believe with you. You mm. know what I'm saying? I love that. But I mean, how do, how do you kind of maneuver with that? Because like one is... 
I see you feel like you're writing for a new motherfucker every week. Like, nah, you got so, so many. Yeah. How do you keep it between, like, just the balance of, like, you know, you're going to get the bag and do what you do versus stuff that you stay inspired by? If I don't like it, I don't do it. Oh, yeah, straight up. If you... Nah, for sure, for yeah. sure. Like, if I'm not a fan of somebody's music or if I don't get in the studio and I'm like, man, creatively we mesh well, yeah. then I'll just pass on certain things. But that's because I'm at this level now. Like, but before, previously, and come my come up yeah. is every bag. Yo, know, come on, bring it on. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, like, right. this ain't the floodgate to let every street nigga think they can. <laughs> Hit my DM right. and get back. Like, nah, that what it is. But if you're yeah. talented and you got a bag, you can get a record from me for sure. Nah, for sure. I love that. Um, I wanted to get into the to the young blue record, man. Yeah. Sexy mother. Yeah. I said, whoo, that's one yeah. of those. Like you first hear it. Yeah. You feel good, summertime. Yeah. When you making records, like explain the process, cause like I feel like like you got the artist in there, right? right you got the right. producer, you got the engineer, you got yourself. Like, mm -hmm. how do you just Con, you know, concoct the record with all of these different chefs in the kitchen. Like, so what does it look like? this how that record happened. So basically, we started off, um, we were doing like a camp. Like everywhere I go, I kind of like, when I work, I, it's, it's like a campish type of vibe to where like I have two people that co-write records with me or whatever, or I might have three other co-producers with me. In this camp, it was myself, OG Parker, Nonstop, um, T. Romano, Krishan, Ivory Scott, and, yeah. and Blue was there, and we were there to work on a record for Blue. And, um, we were going through beats. I'm like, that's the one. Mm. You pulled it up. Nah, hold up. Wait, so hold up. Time <laughs> out. How you know when it's the one? Is it just like an instinct? It's, yeah, like, it's an instinct to me. Like, yeah. I just have, a, a, I feel like I got a pulse and like a, a, just, a, just a feeling that, that, that comes, comes over me when I hear something I know is like a hit that, you know what I'm saying? I yeah. really feel like people will resonate with. And I think that that's a lot of things that people don't um, recognize too. I think the best part of being a producer is establishing the fact that once you tap into a certain frequency and people are liking it, then you shouldn't shy away from it. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, you got to stay in that. The song can change, the melodies can change, the, the canvas of the music can change, but you got to stay locked into that frequency. So mm. we did... Um, we did the record on the spot together. I'm not gonna lie, Blue was in a room like that, and that's not normally how it really goes for me. Like I usually make a bunch of records in the studio and just go to studios and just hand out records. Like, yo, Chris okay. Brown will be dope on this. You right. know, Jeremiah and Tyler, this this right. feature, and then that's how it really goes. But um, that one was really organic. Blue was there. He was there for the whole process. He was like, yo, we gotta have a crazy motherfucking lyric or whatever, man. That they done. Right. And that. Ivory Scott went in the booth and he did like a mumble or something like that and he said sexy something it was like sexy mother and it was like oh and shit and that's when you just damn I'm like damn this is great so we ended up rearranging the record or whatever he finished the melody we all wrote the lyrics together my partner Krishan actually recut the song and re-added his sauce on it because me and Krishan were great together mm -hmm. with Chris Brown presented it to Chris Brown. I ain't gonna lie, like I went set at Chris Brown house for one night, like it was a party over there, we was acting yeah. crazy, like we ain't cut the record, but it was a cool little vibe or whatever, we hung right. out all night, and he was like, yo, like this this one of the ones, I'm gonna do mm. it, and then he ended up doing it. Same time, he did Wale Angles yep. at the same around time too. Man, I, I love that. Mm. I mean, I think it's just dope, like, cause you, it feel like, you know, you, you a quarterback, right? Like you yeah. were in the fucking studio with all these moving parts and trying to figure it out, like, how does it go when, is it like, you trying to set the vibe for the artists and get them to fuck with your vibe? Or is it kind of like you going off of them? Like, Nah, most of the time I'm just really making a song that I'm impressed with and the people that's around me are really impressed with. And then we able to go give that song to somebody else. Yeah. Like it's not like, it's not like I, I'm not, I promise you 90% of the time I'm not in the studio like, all right, I'm doing this song for for her or I'm doing right. a song for 2 Chains tonight. Like, I'm just making just songs making yeah. and making 10 records and then I'm able to go around and be like, nah, this going to work for you or this, you know what I'm saying? And have my influence on the record and that's right. how they come across. Nah, I love that. Uh, tell me about like even the, the rap records because, you know, I think mm -hmm. it's important that people know and understand because a lot of these records people hear and may not know it's you yeah. who did the... Uh, the, the King Von, Lil Dirk, yeah, still, whoo, still trapping. Man, this that OG. Yeah. So tell, it, it, does the approach kind of change, like being like from, you know, you do the, you got the sexy motherfucker type records, the ladies, whatever, whatever. When you're doing the, like a hard street rap record, does the approach change for you? Nah, it's just all about making some shit that we like, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like ultimately my whole background is like, I love R&B, but I come from a rapper background. So like, that's why I work so well with people that do melodies and things of that nature. Or sometimes I might have a melody and somebody else will flush out an idea that I have. Yeah. So when we did Still Trapping, we were in Miami. I had never met King Von before or whatever. 
We went to the studio. Um, they set us up for us to work together. Mm -hmm. Went in. We did probably like 10 songs in one night or whatever. And that mm -hmm. was just one of the songs out of the 10. Yeah. King Von came. The hook was already on the song. And I'm like, bro, you just got to take this and make this shit your own. You know what I'm saying? Because he was like, I ain't never worked like this before, gang. Like, what yeah. you mean? Like, I'm supposed to say what y'all niggas just said and do it? I'm right. like, yeah, bro, just take it, rework the hook, yeah. make it your own way or whatever. And I know it might not be 100% what you would say, but it's there. You right. just got to work around it. Right. He went in there. He like, oh, hell no, this shit too easy, gang. I'm going to kill all this shit. Yeah. He went, and I think we did five records that night. Damn. And um, still trapping it up being one of the ones. That shit got a plaque to it. Go Dirk album just went um, gold. And then we did mine too on his album. His album's gold now too. Yeah. And um, shit, we got about three more that's gonna come out as well. I love that, man. That's that's fire. I mean, when you dealing with you know these these young niggas, that type of energy, yeah. and being that it's rap too, right? Like, so yeah. you know, you got this like, man, I ain't using nobody else's. Yeah. Like, how you get around that part? Like, just... it's a hook. I think all that shit is a myth. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, I think that it, once you get to a point to where like. If a nigga bring, you gotta be a fool if a nigga bring you a hit and all you gotta do is rap on this shit. Nigga right. just lay out a whole song right. for you that can be yours. So I mean, I think the smart people really tie into that and they really make it make it a thing. And like that's how we've been able to make a living in this whole business. Mm. I, I love that. You got the drink? Bring that. I'll show you. Bring that. Take yeah. a shot. We yeah. got some little little drink. You know what I'm saying we get hey, some yeah, stokes, man. Up, you know what I'm saying? Nah, for I'm sure. I'm gonna tell you yeah, thing too. I ain't, I ain't got no filters. So no. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, let's get into yeah. it. Now listen. All right. One of the things we know, internet knows, you had the biggest fucking rebrand. Right. One of the biggest rebrands of all time. Right. Like when you talking about, we talking about like rebrands or whatever, whatever. Right. I gotta go back, like just to kind of get the. Let's think about it. Go ahead. Take yeah. us back. We got. All right. So. Obviously, like I grew up, nigga, like Young Bird, like I grew mm -hmm. up listening to Young Bird, Sexy right. Cannot, nigga. I got dubs in high school, like yeah. that was a thing, right? We seen all the street shit that happened, all right. the Detroit shit, all right. the New York shit, man, you know, whatever, right. whatever. What point for you was it like, nigga, we about to switch the whole program? Like, cause that, that was like, it's not an easy thing to do that effectively, right. you know what I'm saying? So like, what point did you feel like, I, I need Truthfully, to switch the program? Um, so look, I. I had a deal with Epic Records, a partnership that me and my partner Billy J had able to accumulate or whatever with the Sexy Lady and Sexy Can I and Shout the business and all them songs or whatever. So the guy who signed me, Charlie Walk, was leaving the company. He was the president of the company. And like, I didn't know what that meant for me or whatever. I'm like, oh, so you leaving? Like, what, what does that mean? And yeah. They didn't drop me or nothing like that, so they kept me at the company because I was having so much success. But I went through a lot of trials and tribulations, so I went and seen Charlie before he got got ultimately got fired. I hate to say that or whatever, yeah, but yeah. Um, I was like, bro, uh, what the fuck? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. I was a kid, you know what I'm saying at the time, and he was like, Bert. I have no concerns about you and the rest of your career. And he probably, he might have been bullshitting, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, because can't nobody expect, yeah. you know what I'm saying? He's like, I have no concerns for your career. You want to know why you're always going to be good? Because you know Melody. And I was like, mm. yeah, but no, nigga. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Like, what right. that mean? Like, right. so he left the label and I ended up um, getting released from the label. And at that time, like, I ain't going to lie, like, I was just still lost in the sauce, like, you know what I'm saying? Wilding out, still having a... 20,000, 30,000 a month house with five niggas living in it, yeah. 10 bitches everywhere, you know what I'm saying? Just yeah. wilding out doing all that. And um, at that point, I moved to Miami. A football player by the name of Brian McKinney, he used to play for the Minnesota Vikings. He moved me to Miami. He was like, yo, I'm starting my own label. I'm going to put you in Miami. I'm going to put you in a crib by yourself or whatever, give you a studio and just do your thing. And mm -hmm. you can live rent free. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm spending like 30, 40, 50 grand a month over overhead. Right. Let me go ahead and do that. I went down there. I locked in. And I just started writing a bunch of records. And I, a bunch of different people came in my life. Um, Jordan Hollywood, who signed a QC now, or whatever. Yep. This girl named Mia Ray. They would just became like vessels for me to get ideas out. And I was still doing my rap shit at the time. And then I created a song with this girl, Mia Ray, that landed into my guy Jer's hands, who's Vincent Herbert's cousin. Okay. And that led me to meeting Vincent Herbert and Tamar Braxton. And then I did that record and that flew me back to LA and from there that's when love and hip hop happened. Hold on, and that but, was my hold first on, you alright. So how did you because if we go for the point like, mm -hmm. all right, you you know, you say your man was Charlie Wolk, he mm -hmm. was leaving, you was trying to figure it out. Uh -huh. But how did you go from cause I feel like it's probably not an easy thing to go from like 
just mentality wise. Like I'm a rapper, mm-hmm. I want to be in front of this shit. You know what I mean? Rapper lifestyle, whatever uh-huh. the case is. But the decision to be like, yo, I could do it this way. Like, no, it was fucked up, bro. Because you know what I'm saying? Like, ultimately, I'm, even right now, like how I snuck back in the game on some hitmaker shit. I'm yeah. still Young Berg, so it's right. like you walk up, and even if you're not familiar that I'm hitmaker and I produce these records, like, it's like what oh, the fuck? Oh shit, Young Berg's here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. was dealing with that, and a lot of people came in my life that were good people. Rico Love, I'll never forget. He put his arms around me or whatever, and like, yeah. he told me. Like, bro, you got to change your name. I'm mm. like, what? I'm like, I'm already me. I'm like, <laughs> right. I'm going to change my face? Like, right. what are you talking about? He's like, no, just change. You have to change your name. So I didn't have a name at the time. And he would bring me around and, like, Fat Joe would be in sessions with him at Circle House. And Rico would be introducing me, like, to Fat Joe. Like, what's up, man? It's Christian, yeah. and, which is my real name. Right. And Fat Joe like, nigga, that's Young Bird. <laughs> He's like, no, nah, but right. no, it's Christian. You right. know what I'm saying? And... It's crazy how shit works now. Now I'm TS. I got a tail squad chain, yeah, all type of right. shit. You know what I'm saying? But right. so that's how they would like introduce me or whatever. And he was one that was real influential in that. And then I, while I was in Miami working with Brian McKinney, the football player, DJ Infamous, I ended up doing a song called Double Cup for him featuring Jeezy, Ludacris, and um, Juicy J. And I performed the hook on the record. And mm-hmm. that's the first time I ever said hit maker. And it came out like, I think this shit is like 2010 or something like that. And I yeah. say it on the song. And like, I'm just like, I didn't even like consciously be like, man, I'm changing my name to hit maker. And right. I, I just was doing an ad lib and was like, hit maker. Yeah. And yeah. then I was like, oh shit. Man, that's it. Man, mm-hmm. I'm gonna keep doing this in front of every song. I love that, I love that. So I. Well, at what point did you start to feel like, like, all right, because you, you know, you mm-hmm. you did the rebrand yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you got it mentally. But, like, like I said, is now we watching it outside looking at fans, right? Where right. it's like, one, you know it's going to be hard to, it's already hard to rebrand. But then it's like, yo, all the street shit's happening. Mm-hmm. They say, you got your chain, snatch, mm-hmm. da, da, da. How did you get to the point where you feel like you got the industry to take the rebrand seriously, too? Um, shit, as the hits just started coming, I think, uh... I did Big Sean bounce back. Shout out to Smash mm, David, Big Sean, record. Metro Boomin. Yep. That was one of like the first records that really started going, going crazy. And my tag was on that record. And that I did Chris Brown party with my partner, um, Chris Sean. That record is multi platinum or whatever. And like that kind of opened up the door. And like for me to go back to the Breakfast Club, then I went to the Breakfast Club, and I ain't gonna lie, I was capping. Like, I w- I've been talking to executives, yeah. but nobody really told me, like, yo, they would give me a job. So, like, I was Smart. on a breakfast club, and I'm like, man, listen, here go all the records I did. I was just on a slew of records. I was on a, a tear at that time and yeah. still am right now. But I'm like, yo, um, these executives offer me jobs, too. Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, every um, every exec want to give me a job. And then from there, <clears throat> one, of my, yeah, one of my mentors, Ryan Press, was like a... Uh, would you work for Atlantic? And I'm like, yeah. And I already knew Mike Kaiser. And he like, yo, I'm going to yeah. set up a meeting for you to um, Craig Calvin and Julie Greenwald. I went in there and I was just like, yo, look, I've known y'all. I've known Julie because I was signed to DMX when I was like a kid. Yep. That's how I know Kaiser or whatever. I'm like, I've known y'all. I'm cut from that Irv Gotti, Dame Dash, um, just that type of cloth or whatever, just the creativeness, the, the whole ecosystem that you guys had at Dep Jam when mm-hmm. it was starting off. And like, I'm going to be the next like Diddy yeah and like yeah just left it like that kind of dropped mike and did my resume and just gave them that energy and they end up making me vice president and man I, I love that that's mm-hmm. that's a true testament just to the you know the work ethic and the grind you know yeah, what i saying? think that's like keep... t- into 2016. man I, I, I really love that so if we talking about just from a standpoint of like you know rapping versus songwriting mm-hmm. which one makes more will you will you make more rap? i don't know are you a successful rapper yeah, like a success, not Drake level, not that type okay. of, but let's say like a moderate, let's say if you like moderately, let's say like Benny the Butcher or something like that. Like a I Benny don't want to the... say no names. <coughs> All right, no, I'm saying level, not Benny personally. Like I'm not sure. Level. So I, I personally would say, um, I think it, 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 it's, it's twofold, you know what I'm saying? Because I think as a rapper, you have an opportunity to make more than a songwriter because if you write your own songs yeah. and you out there performing your own songs every day, then you collecting the whole bag, you right. merch and all this other shit, everything around the board. If um, But with me and with the whole fucking mass of hits and just records that I've been involved with or whatever, I mean, shit, like, I mean, I, I mean, I live like a 
a, 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 yeah. a rapper that like yeah. I, I'm, I'm that's popping. You know right. what I'm saying? Right, like, right. It is what it is. You it's like it better thing. this way or the, or the other side? Yeah, and with my age, where I'm at, I'm in my thirties now. So like, I never wanted to be like totally stuck into that box. I think that when I came out, I had my own hit records. People didn't understand I was writing and producing those records ourselves, yeah. and we were our own machine. They thought I was just some light skinned cute nigga that they put some songs on, uh -huh, and then right. it what it is. Right. So I always wanted to evolve and actually become executive like following the lead uh, footsteps of L.A. Reeds and people like that or whatever. So this is just the next chapter and journey in my career, for real. Yeah, I love that. Tell me the difference between like uh, like a producer and a beat maker. Like I see that conversation right. around where it's like, you know what I'm saying? Is it the same shit, like different kinds of things? No, it's totally different, but I don't think one can live without the other. So I don't like to downplay any of the, the situations or whatever because it's people that I work with that are beat makers, you know what I'm saying? But they beat could inspire something or I could tell them like, yo, I want to make this beat. I want to do this, whatever. And I could never speak to them again and go make a hit record and go number one. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. And on the other end, there's people I work with that are actual producers that really respect what I do so much and we able to collaborate. Or if I have a lead idea, they just like, man, nigga, you know what you're doing. Just go yeah. ahead and do this shit. So it's not really like all that shit. Yeah. Got, them lines and got skewed because it's all dick hole and it's Instagram. It's all type of shit or whatever where niggas want to be like, I did this or I did that or whatever. But I think that without every part aligning at the same time, then it wouldn't be able to get the same result. So I think that we all should just big each other up. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. one day that beat maker can be a producer. And mm. one day a producer can say, I don't even want to produce mm -hmm. records no more. I'm just going to sit in the house and make they beats all day. Right. So it all works the same way. Nah, I feel that. I like that. Um... Tell me, and I'm gonna go to the love of hip hop part. You told right, me, ahead, you know what I'm saying? You, you got it. I ain't really watching too crazy, mm -mm. but like, I used to see, you know, catch the headlines, doing shit right. like that. When you did that, was it because you know what it is? Like, when love of hip hop, you know, mm -hmm. like, they're gonna try to put the spin on and make shit look crazy. Did right. you enjoy that experience? Did you, like, what was your vibe just being a part of that whole shit? Um, you know, I don't never regret anything. I think it was a, it was a learning experience, and it was, it was, it was whatever. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I think at that point in my career, I was working with so many big artists that I wanted people to know exactly what I was doing. And then my mind state was that even if I go on Love & Hip Hop and make a hit record on Love & Hip Hop, then mm -hmm. I kind of like defied all the odds. Because I was working with Nicki Minaj heavily at the time, Diddy, like yep. a bunch of different people. And um, our relationships were so good at the time that she was like, yo, you can say that you're working with me on Love & Hip Hop. Like, I don't mm -hmm. care. Like, go do okay. your thing. Yeah. It wasn't like no censorship on that. So I'm like, man, I'm just going to take this opportunity to let people know what I'm doing on a large platform. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, Mona going to do what Mona do. <laughs> but, right. you know what I'm right. saying? Like, at the end of the day, like, shit, look where I am now. I'm here on Cigar Talk. So I can't yeah. really be mad at nothing like that. Nah, for sure. I love that. I mean, I, I think I seen you. You tweeted the other day, like, having a girl before you got money is, is hard. Cause you no, know, it's just frightening. Yeah. So tell me about that now, right? Like, we just told my love hit, but you, you know, you know, they, they know who you are. You lit, you yeah. know, AP shit bust down, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, how is it, like, just, you know, at the point you at, like, is it like, damn, finding a girl is, like, is it just tough for real? Or is it like... I think it's a real conversation because when you meet a woman, when you're at an elevated level and she hasn't been through the turmoil with you or seen you at a downplay level, no AP, no none of this or whatever, and y'all in a fucking Uber X together or yeah. some shit like that, them the type of relationships that really last and you know what I'm saying, go a lifetime. Like I wish that I, but my life is different. I didn't graduate high school. I dropped out of ninth grade. I got my first record deal when I was in ninth grade. Mm. I was signed to DMX. So like my whole life has been music in a whole whirlwind. So I don't even know how it's possible unless I meet a woman that has her own, and has her own shit going for herself or whatever, or a woman that's just totally out of this music business, like, or right, whatever, okay, okay. has no intentions, no Instagram, no none of that, or whatever. You can have an Instagram, but just like, you, to say you know the, no, yeah, you know yeah, the okay, difference, difference between, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So maybe. I mean, so do you think, I feel like, do you think if we talking about like, you know, the Instagram high, you know, a mm -hmm. couple hundred thousands, blue yeah, checks, whatever, yeah. like, would you, would you wife one of them? Girl, like you, you don't take. Oh, you don't if take it serious. Nah, like. if she understood me, you know what I'm saying. Like I think that that th those are the only options. Either gonna be somebody in the music business that understands what I'm doing, yeah. that can be um around me and know like what I have to go through, or has to be somebody just very removed from it that just only gives a fuck about me. Right. I would prefer the girl unless you got a bag. No, nah, yeah. if we in the music business and you yeah. successful and we being successful together, and I think that could be a beautiful thing. But like I would lean more so as to 
the the girl that's just out the loop of all this shit. So what what you feel like you know allows you to feel like shit genuine at this point? Like you say, you I don't know. Like if a bitch, if, if a no. girl meets you at this level, it's lit already. Like it's lit right it's now. It's not genuine. It's not. No. If they meet you now, it's not. All right, here go an example, right? Let's take all our accolades and everything away from us or whatever that we yep. got going on. Yeah. If you meet Kim Kardashian or somebody like, oh, I, that's a bad reference because she married her with our respect. Oh, now she divorced her. now. That's a good reference uh, now. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> if you meet if you meet somebody, Kim Kardashian or whatever, yeah. you a bum nigga or whatever, you not looking at her like, man, I'm trying to get to know whatever, blah, blah. Right. You already got Google that you can go hit to where you think you know this motherfucker, this, right. that, and all this other stuff. Then that'll bleed into your psyche and then you just ultimately looking at it like, man, shit, if that's my girlfriend, I'm lit. She yeah. got the bag. Right. I'm going to get something out this so it's not coming from a pure intention. It's not like, yo, like, I, I know you and just, Najee, I just love you and I've been there forever. You know, ain't one of them type of things. Nah, for sure. That, man, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, when, I know I seen, what was this, maybe a year or two ago where you had the situation at the crib. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I guess, you know, we talking about just girls being around and whatever, whatever. Yeah, that was scary. My nigga, tell me about that. Like, because I seen it, obviously, I seen the headlines, I seen it, but it's like, mm-hmm. You know, it seemed like I guess from what I seen, it said like she tried to she tried to set you up, and you know niggas tried to kick the really door. It wasn't really a try, like yeah, like oh, she set yeah, she set you me up. up. Yeah, it was one of them situations where like I was lined up, and um, I don't know through the grace of God, like certain precautions and just me mentally or whatever, like she wanted me to do different things, like let's get in a jacuzzi or let's do this or whatever. And I was like, no, like what the fuck? Hold on, is that out the norm though? Like if you're chilling with a, are you chilling with a girl at the crib, you got first, some drinks, she first, like in a jacuzzi, was, I feel regular It was me? the first day of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you talking about jacuzzi <laughs> nah, if it's COVID real. outside? Then not only that, yeah. it was like, three in the morning, you know what I'm saying? It's right. cold as hell. I live in LA, so you you know anything about right. LA. It be, it's, cold it's cold at night. night. And yeah, so yeah, like, what fact. are we doing? Like, why would right. I do that? And um, it just, it just, it went left and it went crazy. And like, I, I knew what was happening like after the fact when she was trying to like, you know what I'm saying, manipulate and do things, but I couldn't talk to the girl because once she committed, did what she did, yeah. and I had all that shit on camera or whatever, I was just like, man, let me just fall back, and then, you know, um, man, I don't know, the, the girl just then disappeared, like, I don't know. So how how long, like, because my thing, and, and this is what I just wonder, because we see shit like that, right? Mm-hmm. Like, rappers, artists, like, people getting set up, we seen pop, you know That was, I mean? like, Different. in that era, though, and the same people that came to my shit it ended up being the same people that was in line with the pop shit. Man, that's, that's a... And that shit was crazy. For sure. I mean, so, like, when you when you interacting with like women like that how do you now like I don't just, interact like that no more nah, that shit changed everything yeah for sure like serious PTSD from that or whatever like yeah. everything gotta be super like vetted out like can't bring no women to your crib you know what I'm saying sure. like or at least you gotta you gotta gauge it out you know what I'm saying and really fill them out before you bring them around you know what I'm saying because it's just it's just so much at stake and you never know you think like on a humble, you think you really finna just get some pussy and, and, and it's just be people a whole, got different intentions. That's a fact. Hold up, so when it, cause mm-hmm. I, I think I seen the video, did they actually get in the crib or mm-hmm. they was trying to get in the crib mm-hmm. and then it just. Yeah, and they work out like that. How do you, obviously outside of just the women part, how do you kind of position yourself to try to avoid those types of situations? Like, I don't know. I mean, shit, I got 24 seven security. So it really don't matter. Even when that happened, I did, but I was at my house. It was the first day of COVID, and it was super early, and I'd known a girl, like a little previously, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so I thought it was smooth. Any other way, it wouldn't have been that. So this was somebody you already been new then? Yeah, I've been smashed. So how you... That's kind of crazy, though, because you, you would feel like it would have happened before if it was... You know what I'm saying? Or, like, it take time to really... I don't know. Like, to be honest, like, you never know what um, amount of people or whatever just come around and... And and you know who she could have been around or whatever the influences could have be. I would I wouldn't even know. Nah, for sure, man. Just kind of moving forward, man. Like, are you in a space where you trying to create your own album? I know I thought I see something. Oh yeah, like, I'm doing it right now. Saying, are yeah, you putting it? Yeah. Is it like a Khaled style? Like you just yeah. gotta. Yeah, for sure. It's a yeah. producer album. My first um, single was Thought Box. I did a male version with Meek, Two Chains, A Boogie. Um, Tiger and YB in the mirror and mm-hmm. like I put money into it it really didn't go the way I wanted it to go or whatever then from there I ended up doubling back and doing a remix with all women so I put Dreezy, Young and May, Chinese Kitty, Dream Doll and um oh, damn I don't want to yeah I might be missing 
and Mulatto oh, Mulatto on the record. Right? Shout out yeah. to Mulatto. Shout out to all the ladies. I'm sorry about that. And um, that record ended up going gold. And um, so from there, my next single we just dropped is called Quickie featuring Ty Dolla Sign and Queen Nigel. Love that. I'm going to keep throwing out singles, you know what I'm saying, doing what I do. And then from there, I'll probably drop an album, Top of the Year. Top of the Year. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what's up, man. Um, I know you got to go. I'm going to take up too much of your time. Yeah, Tyler. Um, I wanted to know this question. The internet always asks this question. Mm-hmm. They they got the, uh, I want to know from your perspective, dinner, verse, dinner with Jay-Z or 500K. What, what makes the most sense to, to take if you had the option? In my position right now, to yeah. me today. Like for you. I'm going to take the dinner with Jay. Why? I just know I'm very charismatic and I know how the conversation would go and what the opportunities would be. Mm-hmm. I think that... um. If anybody else in another position, 500K could be very influential in their life. And I would take that. If you wasn't like in an elevated situation, I would take the 500 and just put the work in with the 500 that would get you to meet regardless back with Jay. Right. Or, but nah, for me, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to Taking the Jay. Yeah. Do you, is 500 enough to really like it ain't really a, it ain't it ain't really 500k yeah like if it, if it was like 500 is that enough for you to feel like all right i got the 500 now i can bust moves to get the whatever i gotta get or is it just crazy like, if you sign a major label deal you lucky if you getting 500 unless you got a real motion with you mm. so if you do a major label deal and you barely get 500 then yeah if you could start from ground zero and have 500 yourself and not be in nobody pocket then for sure yeah hey you ever met jay before and had a conversation yeah it was a bin war for me i was gonna sign an either rockefeller dmx record label and it it was multiple tommy boy was open back in the day i probably had like five six seven deals on the table i got some crazy memories with jay like now i remember um the lakers had won a championship and it was a it was a club called luna park in l.a and um, the guys that I was with at the time, they were like some big guys, some heavy steppers from Chicago or whatever. They paid to get me in a club. Shout out to my dog, Bugs, that's still with me to this day. He's Kanye's right-hand man on the producing and all this other stuff. Yeah. And um, everybody was in a club. Dr. Dre, Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, um, Jay-Z, Dame Dash, Exhibit, this person, that person. And I, like Bugs, I was like literally like probably like four foot four and like, 13, 14, yeah. and Bugs took me all around the club. I met everybody. Then the club is leaving, like Jay Z and uh, and I mean, excuse me, Dr. Dre, and I think Shaq is walking out the club. Jay Z and all them other different people, and like we're leaving the club. Like the stairs up here, we're on the stairs, and like Hove is down there, and like the guy Bugs who works with Kanye still, he like, hey yo Jay. And it was like the club just stopped like a movie. He like, right. nigga, you ain't heard shit until you hear my shorty spit. And Jay was like, man, I'm saying I ain't heard nothing. I right. break through the crowd, get to kicking my shit, going crazy okay. or whatever. Yeah. Jay, there, Dame, there. They like, oh, you hard. Uh, you know what I'm saying? We exchange information. From there, I had like a battle with like Exhibit and all different people outside the front of the club or whatever. Then from there, I went, sat down with hip hop and sat down with everybody. And then there was an opportunity there. Mm, I love that. That's what's up, man. Mm-hmm. Um, your catalog is so extensive. We we got to get a verses off, my nigga. We got to get you with it. Don't nobody want no smoke with me. I mean, listen, I've been thinking about this shit hard, too. I ain't gonna mm-hmm. lie. You know who I... If, if it's you mm-hmm. versus Mustard, mm-hmm. I don't know, my nigga. I'm telling you versus Mustard, that's a hard battle right I there. I think it's gonna be a good one, but I think I got a lot of joints that a lot of people don't know. Like, and yeah. I'm coming in, ultimately, is the underdog per se so like i love that position yeah do you would you be interested in the whole versus shit like he you don't want, want no smoke with me mustard no I, and it's okay. not right, it's not because right, so i what, yo i work with mustard yeah, me and yeah. mustard our plaques together this is not like no downplay nah, 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 or whatever because yeah, that nigga's a go to what he does but i'm just confident in myself and i don't think right, like so i want to know what level i right, so if i say all right so we go up from mustard another level say like all right now let's say mustard let's say like just blaze. Nah, I think that's different. That's like the fucking that's a two OG. different ever type OG ever. All right. I, yeah. So let me go to the middle. I'm trying to think of an, like all right, Mike Will. Um, I think he had, he had, he had era before me too. Nah, come on, y'all kind of like the similar. See, you gotta think Elvis. between in that era or whatever. Like I stopped rapping and, and doing my shit like what 2008, 2009. So I went kind of blank until. When in that in that era, that's when Mike Will when I when I stopped being relevant and what well, as a rapper, Mike Will took off, and then it took me a few years to come back. So I think that his run, a heavily run, 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 was in that was era. Little, okay. Yeah, when I wasn't creating music. All right. So what about like Zaytoven then? Oh come on, man, Zaytoven, no, uh, uh-uh. uh. Nope. I think it would have to be. 
And these all yeah. My tell peers me who you think is on the level that I think it was either me versus London on the track or me versus oh, I like that too. Um, Mustard. So I think that's those only two that man. really yeah. You versus London, I like that too. Damn, people that got hits and I got hits with both of them. Right. Damn. Okay. I like that. I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, just you know, moving forward, bro. Like you know, how, how do you keep the the momentum? How do you keep just like I said, I, I watched mm-hmm. your whole shit, nigga. <laughs> since you know what I mean, young yeah. bird. How do you continue to just, you know, elevate, man? Just go to the studio every fucking day. Mm. Like, I like I, I love this shit. I love coming to talk with people or whatever and just interacting with everybody or whatever. But, like, my pure passion is just to be in the studio every day yeah. to make records. Like, it's nothing better than, like, not having shit and then going somewhere, having a couple drinks, smoking a couple blunts or whatever, yeah. and leaving and waking up in the morning again, having some shit. Yeah. Like, that's a high and a right. feeling that I'm never going to run away from. I love that. I yes, love that. Sir. Um, lastly, man, just real quick. I mean, mm-hmm. you've had a million fucking sessions, different mm-hmm. people. You wrote for Beyonce, you writing, whatever. You know what I'm saying? What What you feel like was the most memorable session that kind of just sticks out in your head? Something like, damn, like, nigga, this one, this one was like. Mm. A crazy, what's a crazy, crazy session? Um, shit, we talked about Vaughn. I'm rest in peace of Vaughn. That was a pretty crazy session for me. I think one of the more recent sessions that people gonna have to wait for, which would be dope to talk about on Cigar Talk. Um, myself, Jeremiah, Two Chains, and Big Sean was in the studio at the same time. Mm. We ended up cooking up a bunch of crazy records at the same mm. time, and it's one that's that's really like a standout type of joint or whatever. It's two that stand out. And well, all of them. <sighs> I like Sean, man. I like Sean, man. Oh, lastly, I had one this one other story. Uh-huh. I think I seen you tweet. You said, uh, I've been doing this shit since T Pain pulled me Nuvo in the club or some shit like that. I was like, nah, what was that? What nah, was- but on some G shit, that was a line that Drake said, but like it's it's just fucked me up because like I was literally like like the second guy I, I was on the scream tour. Yeah. Like T Pain was like the headliner of the scream right. tour or whatever with Young Jock and myself and all right. these different people and like T Pain really had Nuvo and T Pain like I ain't gonna lie like I love T Pain right now T Pain was an asshole when he was like that oh, nigga. Yeah? Yeah, it, 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 we, we can laugh about it. Nah, you know hold what up, saying? cause he yeah, said you see how he said uh, like he he be seeming like now like niggas was mean to him like he was like Kanye was. You know what I'm saying? Giving it to him when T Pain had it. Right. Was he being an asshole? I got, was he two, an asshole? I got two T Pain stories. Yeah, give me some T-Pain. And I, I like T Pain. And he's all in respect or whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got love for T Pain. And actually, T Pain showed me a lot of love when I was in transition into Hitmaker or whatever as yeah. well. So um, we was on the Scream tour. I never forget it. Like you got to think about this shit. It's like 2007. It's before Wayne had really touched the auto tune. Like I like when I did that song, the business. Like I was really like the second nigga that used the auto tune and sang right. on some shit like that. Right. So I did a, a record, um, and I went and I was on tour with T Pain, and like he used to just be like joking like all the time, like walking my dressing room like. You need an alignment? You need my barber to come give you a line? Oh, like, like some hairline shit? No, nigga, but he wasn't talking <laughs> about shit. He ain't have a barber. He ain't had nothing. Yeah. He was just running around with Nouveau and just tweaking or whatever. So from there, I had a record. I played it for him. I'm like, yo, T-Pain was hot as fish grease. Yeah. I'm like, yo, smoke re sing this shit, please. And, and um, I don't know, like, he kind of, like, made me depressed and, like, gassed me at the same time. He was like... What? What do you need me on this shit for? You sound just as good as me, nigga. You don't need me on. And I think he <laughs> was really curve. bullshit. That was the curve, yeah. <laughs> nigga, the but it curve. put the battery in my back. They were like, oh, hell no, T Pain. Say, I can sing good on auto tune. I'm on their ass and I'm about to be on all oh, this auto-tune shit. Auto tune everything. So shit. That, yeah. that's what happened from there. And then later in life, a crazy story with T Pain. And T Pain told this story to Joe Button, so I ain't even mad at telling the story. So I was living in Atlanta, this in the midst of me trying to get my shit back together and like become this executive and writer and producer. And like I did, I used to be at T-Pain house all the time. Like yeah. I ended up getting introduced to him, re- reintroduced. We started working together, whatever. I had a bunch of records or whatever. He, We was vibing, you know what I'm saying? I was doing records on his album. In fact, I think I did two records on that album at the time. And then from there, we had this record, it's called Bad Bitches Link Up or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, I gave him the record. I was doing the, um, the hook with him at first. And then mm-hmm. fucking, um, at that time, I wasn't really cool with Bow Wow because like, oh, we yeah. were like some young niggas, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 even yeah. though me and Bow Wow are cool now, it's yeah. all 100. And um, 
the nigga was like, man, like he had went and put Trey songs on the song and Juicy J on the song. We would play the song and get drunk and turn up. But I'm like, I'm on the hook. I'm like, damn, I'm about to be back out here. Like, yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah. And um, one day I went back to his crib and I was working with him and he's like, I got something to play. Nigga took you and off. I was like, eh. And he took me off and he put Bow Wow on the song. You know what I'm saying? What I was saying. He like, you know, I got to get my 106 and Park played it correct. I'm like, oh my God. I ain't going to yeah, lie. Hurt, we we, hurt, we, right? we both yeah. faded. Like, we got into an argument that night. He wanted to kill me that night or whatever. We Hold on. Did you, you you said like, nigga, what, like, did you oh, say well, something? Of course. What do you mean? You like, was mad. You said it? Like, right, I, like yeah, it was, it was up. Yeah. But not up like in a way like that. But like, I felt like me and Payne had a good working report at the time. So I, and we had a few drinks. So I was just letting oh, him have it. it. Yeah. And then he wasn't, you know what I'm saying? He was, he was, and then he got mad too. And then we both got mad and I ended up leaving the studio and then, we ain't talk for a while, but that's just like yeah, another they got moment. They fight in with T Pain. That's kind of hard, though. Nah, this it wasn't really like, a fight. It was just a yelling match. No how you, you feel like you calmed down a lot? I feel like just outside looking in, I, you know, this is the first time we really right. meeting, you know what I'm saying? But it feel like, you know, you you more chill than like what it seemed like before a little bit. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think it's just growth and just evolution or whatever. But I mean, I think that we all are. Are, are um, subjective to have our moments, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. But like yeah. for the most part, I think that I have to, you know what I'm saying, kind of lead by example. I got a lot of people that I help look out for and take care of or whatever that I'm able to like put in position and that's what the most important thing is for me. Nah, for sure. Listen, man, I really appreciate you nah, pulling up, man. Me, bro. Dope shit, dope yeah, stories. Yeah. I got my man Hitmaker. We yes, not Youngberg, Hitmaker only. Yeah. Dropping them hits. Dope episode of Cigar Talk, man. Yes, sir. We out of here.